before this video starts, I just want to quickly apologize for the background noise that is going to be in the next few clips. I did not realize my AC was on when I started filming, and I didn't realize until like 30 minutes of filming that it was on. Um, so I'm very sorry about that. Just wanted to put that out there. If that's going to be an issue, you might just not want to watch this video. Sorry. Hey guys, what is up? My name is Sophie. Welcome back to a new video. And I know the lighting is super shitty. Right now, I have to use like um this desk lamp and it makes me kind of look sort of pink. So today, I am starting out a new series on my channel where we talk about uh, unsolved mysteries, disappearances, or maybe solved mysteries, or just like interesting cases. Because I am extremely, extremely interested in all of this. I find reading about it so interesting. Uh, and like coming up with theories and all of that. I'm sure all of you guys have heard of BuzzFeed Unsolved. I, I love it so much and that's what inspired me to do this series because I want to look into some cases that they haven't covered or they haven't covered yet that maybe aren't as popular or aren't really as talked about. I know there are a lot of YouTubers who do these like unsolved mystery videos but this one that I'm going to be talking about today I couldn't find any other YouTube videos on and this case is the Texarkana Moonlight Murders and if you see me look down or look to the side during this video it's because I have my notebook with notes here and I also have my laptop open if I need to look up anything else. First I'm just going to be going over what exactly happened. There were four attacks that took place and these took place in 1946 in Texarkana, Texas and Texarkana, um, if the name kind of sounds weird, it's like Texas and Arkansas like together uh, because this town was actually on the border of Texas and Arkansas. The majority of the murders took place in Texas on the Texas side but there was one that was on the Arkansas side. So the four attacks took place over what the authorities guess was 10 weeks. And this case actually became so big that it inspired a movie in 1976 called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. World War II had just ended in Texarkana, Arkansas boys had come home to their families. Husbands reunited with their wives. It was a happy, peaceful time. Until the phantom killer struck. For four months, he held an entire city in the icy grip of terror. Now, Charles B. Pierce brings this incredible, shocking, and true story to the screen in The Town That Dreaded Sundown. This serial killer became known as the Phantom Killer or Phantom Slayer because he wore a white mask over his face with the eyelids cut out that resembled um, like sort of a children's uh, Halloween costume of a ghost. You know, like kids go out on Halloween, maybe they get like a pillowcase, they cut the eyes out and they're a ghost. Um, and that's sort of what he dressed like when he killed people. Another important thing to note is that all of the attacks were on couples, often in lovers' lanes, in their cars, except for one, which uh, was in uh, the couple's house. The first attack took place on February 22nd, 1946, and this was a couple parked in their car in a lover's lane that was sort of in the woods. The two victims were named Jimmy Hollis, who was 24, and Mary Jean Larry, who was 19. A masked man walked up to their car, shone a flashlight into the window, and he had a pistol. He then told them to get out of the car, and he instructed Jimmy Hollis to take off his pants. And while he was taking off his pants, he was struck in the head uh, two times with a heavy blunt object and this caused his skull to crack. The Phantom Killer then hit Mary Jean Larry to the ground and she describes the object that she was hit with as an iron pipe. She was then told by the killer to run and as she was running away she could hear her boyfriend being beaten by the killer. And then he ran after her and he sexually assaulted her. She managed to get up and run half a mile to the nearest buildings where she called the cops. And Hollis and Larry actually ended up both surviving the attack, which is very good because uh, one, I mean, they didn't die. And two, um, they were able to help identify um, the killer as the same person who committed the next few attacks, which we are going to go over now. The second attack happened nearly a month later on March 24th, 1946. The victims of this attack were Richard Griffin, who was 29, and Polly Ann Moore, who was 17, and they were both found dead in Richard's car parked in a lover's lane. 
It was shown that Richard Griffin had been shot twice inside the car and then shot once in the back of the head when he was outside the car and basically both of the victims had exited the car is what they found but then the killer put them both back in the car. According to a police report, Polly Ann Moore was killed on a blanket in front of the vehicle before being placed back inside. Another thing to note is that Griffin's pockets of his jeans or pants, I don't know what he was exactly wearing, uh, but they were turned inside out and also in the first attack, the killer asked um, the couple if they had any money. So this second crime, because of this, was seen as robbery related before it was connected to the first one. The third attack took place on April 14th, 1946, and these were the youngest victims, which is just really, really sad. Uh, Paul Martin was 16 and Betty Jo Booker was only 15. Paul Martin was actually driving Betty Jo to a slumber party across town. Paul's body was found lying on the left side of the road and he had been shot four times and Betty Jo's body was found two miles away lying on its back and the pistol that was used in these murders were the same as the second attack. The police were unable to verify if Betty Jo was sexually assaulted and Paul's car was actually found three miles away from her body. The fourth and final attack was actually completely different from the previous three. This attack happened on May 3rd, 1946. Virgil Starks, who was 37, and Katie Starks, who was 36. And they were a married couple and this attack happened in their house. So Katie was in her bedroom lying down on her bed, but Virgil was downstairs or in another room listening to the radio and she heard a sound outside and yelled down to him asking him to turn down the radio. And just a few seconds after this happened, two shots were fired into the back of his head through a window that was closed. And Katie from upstairs figured it just sounded, she, she said it didn't sound like gunshots, it sounded more like he dropped something. So she went down to see what happened. So as she was entering the living room downstairs, she saw Virgil suddenly slump back into his chair and she lifted his head and saw the blood. And then when she realized he was dead, she ran to the phone to call the police. As Katie was calling the police on a phone on the wall, because obviously this is the 40s, they did not have cell phones, so she was using like a dial phone. And as she was calling the police, she was shot twice in the face and she survived the attack, but unfortunately her husband did not. The murder sent the town into panic. Uh, young couples would not go out at night. They would stay inside. Most people would stay inside. They would make sure their kids are inside at night. But there were a few kids, curious kids, who decided to take the sleuthing and detective work into their own hands and they would park in cars in lovers lanes at night to try to catch the phantom. And along with that, police recruited young teens as bait for this. They would have them sit in a car in a lover's lane and they would be have police parked nearby and ready to go if the phantom killer decided to show up. And with that being said, let's get into some of the theories. The first theory I think is a bit of a stretch and it is that the phantom killer is the Zodiac killer. And the reason that people have come up with this theory is because of how similar the two cases are. And although they are similar because um, it was all about couples and it often happened couples parked in lovers lanes between both of the cases. Both of the murders with them happened at night. Both of them were wearing masks, they used um, small handguns, and both of their last known crimes were completely different from the usual pattern. For the phantom killer that was attacking the couple in their home, and for the Zodiac that was killing the taxi car driver. And these cases were also separated by 20 years, which means that the phantom killer would have been about 20 to 30 and the Zodiac would have been about 40 to 50. But the strong psychological differences between the killers lead me to believe that this is not true and it is much more likely that the Zodiac was inspired by the killings of the Phantom Killer rather than it being the same person. For example, the Zodiac concentrated his attacks on the women making sure they were dead while the Phantom uh, concentrated his attacks on making sure the men were dead so they wouldn't disturb his attack on women. Uh, the Zodiac Killer also did not sexually assault his victims, that was not really um, shown to be the cause of the killings while the Phantom Killer was definitely, um, that was one of his reasons. So I don't know, I really don't believe that theory. You guys can let me know your feelings on it down below though. Okay, so this is actually a day later. Uh, I started filming yesterday and then it just got too dark and I had to stop filming. So now I am back and I'm going to be going over the other two suspects in this case that I could find information on. The main suspect, and this is the one that they, everyone was pretty much convinced that he was the Phantom Killer and there was a book published, I think in 
2014, written by a historian and a former reporter who lived in Texarkana, um, which had all of this evidence that really, really framed um, this guy for the murder. So his name, and I know I'm gonna say it wrong, so apologies in advance, is UL Lee Swiney. And he was 29 years old. He was very notorious in the town because he really liked to steal cars. And he had just been in um, like a bad place with police since he was a teenager. And he had just recently gotten married, um, I think a few hours earlier, to uh, Peggy Stevens Swiney, who was 21 years old. And a few hours after their wedding, she gets arrested for stealing a car. I'm not sure exactly how this happened. Um, I guess they were together. Uh, stealing this car as like a fun honeymoon activity, but she was the only one who got arrested. I don't know if maybe uh, the cops got them when they pulled over somewhere and he went to like go to the bathroom or something. I don't really know. Basically, Peggy got arrested and two weeks later, uh, the cops get UL, um, UL, UL. And as they drove him to the station house, he asked a really weird question that raised all of the suspicion against him. He asked, will they give me the chair? meaning is he gonna get like killed for this like the electric chair you know the cops told him you know stealing cars isn't punishable by death so this really led them to think that there is something else going on like this guy did something um to make him think that he could get killed so maybe he didn't know the cops were taking him for stealing cars you know the other main piece of evidence against him is that statements from his wife peggy um, describing the murders and saying all those stuff like really linked him to the killings basically in her statements she went over the nights of the murder and just like all of the stuff um, with the stealing the cars and stuff basically every single night that a murder happened he didn't have an alibi she wasn't with him there were hours and she didn't know where he was which is super suspicious I think personally but the police ultimately found that she was an unreliable uh, witness they didn't have any proof of any of this stuff. Everything was just her account of it and they couldn't fully trust that. So while the police didn't have enough evidence to convict him of these crimes, he did end up in jail with a life sentence for auto theft in 1947. But he actually ended up getting out of jail in 1973 and my research uh, shows that he spent some time in a mental hospital and he ended up dying of cancer in 1994. So. We'll never really get to know if he was, you know, the killer or not because, well, we're never going to be able to get a statement from him because now he's dead. And the last suspect I'm going to be talking about is H.B. Tennyson, who was an 18-year-old college student who actually committed suicide and in his suicide letter he confessed to the crimes. In the description, along with all of my sources, I will leave a link to his confession note, but I will read a quote for you now. Quote, why did I take my own life? Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night and killed Mr. Starks and tried to get Mrs. Starks. You, would ha you wouldn't have guessed it. I did it when mother was either out or asleep and no one saw me do it. For the guns, I disassembled them and discarded them in different places. I mean, that's just creepy. It's it's weird. And the confession note wasn't the only note he left. He left a few others, all of which you can read down below. But this is, I think, the most incriminating one because he literally confesses to it. But at the same time, this kid was not completely mentally stable as, you know, he committed suicide. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who just confess to things who didn't actually do them, whether it's for fame or, you know, fame after death, that kind of thing. Another important thing to note about his letter is that he only confessed to the final two crimes, which still leaves uh, this whole like question of who committed the first two crimes and was he a copycat? So a possible theory is that Swiney committed the first two murders and Tennyson committed the second two. So that is all I have on this case. In the comments section, please let me know what your theories are, who you think the Phantom Killer really is. And if you know of any information about this crime that I left out, leave that in the comments as well. I would really like to see it. And if you want me to continue this series, if you want me to research some more unsolved mysteries and do videos like this for my channel, if you like, you know, the sort of BuzzFeed Unsolved, unsolved mystery thing uh, make sure to leave a thumbs up because I, I really I hope you guys like this because I definitely want to do more videos like this and if you're not already subscribed and you want to make sure to hit subscribe you can follow my social media all that stuff yeah that's it for this video hope you guys liked it and I hope you all have a great day
Bye.